All right, we good to go. Yes. Okay. Well, welcome everyone and a very grateful welcome to our guest speaker, assembly member Laura Friedman. Laura, um, or excuse me, everyone, before we begin, please make sure your cameras and microphones are off. Um, also, just to let you know, the chat function is set to only allow comments to be set to our tech wizard, Steve Gomez Pedroza, SGB Habitat's marketing and communications manager. So if you have any questions for Laura, go ahead and ask in the chat box. And those questions will go directly to Steve and he will get them to me. And time permitting, we will not only get those them asked, but also answered um, towards the end of our time with Laura. So our guest speaker, Assembly Member Laura Friedman, was elected to the California State Assembly in November 2016 to represent the 43rd Assembly District, which encompasses the cities of Burbank, Glendale, and La Cañada Flatridge, as well as the communities of La Crescenta and Montrose, and the Los Angeles neighborhoods of Atwater Village, Beechwood Canyon, Los Feliz, East Hollywood, Franklin Hills, and Silver Lake. In her first term in the assembly, Laura secured $20 million in funding for the completion of the Glendale Riverwalk project and authored a package of bills to encourage water conservation, strengthen environmental sustainability, improve access to higher education and healthcare, and create new avenues for communities to tackle the affordable housing crisis. Laura got her start in the private sector working as a film and television executive and producer after receiving her BA from the University of Rochester, New York. In 2001, she launched her own web-based small business. Building on her years of community service, she was elected to the Glendale City Council in 2009, served as mayor from 2011 through 2012, and was reelected in 2013. Throughout her career, she served on a number of boards and commissions. She served for seven years on the board of directors of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. She is a past president of the Independent Cities Association, was a Hollywood Burbank Airport Commissioner, and a board member of the Southern California Association of Governments, where she was a member of the Energy and Environment Committee. Laura also spent five years on the Glendale Design Review Board. She's a very busy woman, lives in Glendale with her husband and their daughter. Laura, thank you for joining us in our inaugural Women Build a Better World web series. We are so glad you said yes. And are you ready to begin? Yes, thank you. I was so thrilled that you <laughs> asked me. And I will apologize in advance in case my daughter, who's six, makes an unprompted appearance in this video, as she is wont to do when I'm on these uh, types of webinars. That would be wonderful. I think we all can understand uh, what it's like to be working from home these days. Um, okay, so for those of us who aren't familiar with how local government works, what does an assembly member do? So um, the assembly, um, along with the Senate, uh, make up the California legislature, and we basically make the laws for the state of California. We also oversee the, the various public agencies uh, that operate. Um, we are one of the three branches of government, along with the executive uh, go uh, branch represented by the governor and the governor's office and the ju judicial branch of government. Um, so um, the assembly is vaguely equivalent to Congress in the U.S. Uh, um, House. Um, it's a little different here, you know, in, in the, the federal uh, government system, the Senate represents the states itself. Here, the Senate and the assembly are basically the same, except that the senators um, there are half as many of them and they represent more people, but we are a co-equal uh, branch of, of government and all the bills are, we're a bicameral legislature. So all of the bills go through each house and then cross over and go through the other house before going to the governor. Wonderful. So very much a representative and legislative body represent for the state of California. Right. And then each assembly member represents approximately half a million people. Wow, wonderful. Okay, so what, that's a lot. Um, what does a typical week look like for you? Well, right now there are no typical weeks. 
So <laughs> I don't even want to begin to try to describe what my weeks are looking like right now. Um, uh, if I didn't get the LA Times every morning and um, uh, know which Sudoku's come on which day, I think I'd have trouble remembering which day is which right now. Um, uh, although I will say that my work right now is, is even more never ending, it seems. But typically when we're not in a pandemic, uh, on Monday mornings, I drop my daughter um, at her school and then go right to the airport. I usually have about 20 minutes to get to the airport and to the gate or half an hour before my I have to board my plane. Uh, to go to Sacramento. Um, my days are completely filled with um, meeting with um, various groups from across the state who make their way to Sacramento. And you don't know how many advocacy groups and trade groups there are until you work in the legislature and start <laughs> to hear from every type of farmer there is, every type of rancher, uh, people in forestry, people who represent accountants um, or doctors, they all come through and want to talk about their issues along with all of our um, employee groups, uh, all of our uh, providers of services across the state. And then we also as uh, legislators develop our own package of bills that we have to work out with stakeholders and also be on top of all of the other bills that are coming through each house. In a typical year, we might see as many as a thousand bills in a year. Um, and uh, have to hear them through committees. They don't all make it out through the committee process. We have committee processes and I sit on a handful of committees that vet the bills and then when they make it through the committees on each side, they, they come to the floor to be voted on and eventually go to the governor. I'll also uh, mention that I chair the Natural Resources Committee in the Assembly. So within my committee's purview, we um, hear all of the bills that relate to wildfire, forestry, natural resources, and so water, um, clean energy, air quality, CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, uh, which does impact housing, of course, um, solid waste and recycling, Cal Recycle, um, coastlines, and all of the conservancies across the state. So quite a lot of, of jurisdiction. So I get to, to really drill down on all of the bills in those areas um, and also get to um, author um, major bills and legislation dealing with those subjects. Yes, and we are grateful that you do. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. So when you go up to Sacramento at the beginning of the week, when do you come back or how do you represent or understand or get a, the pulse of what's happening for the half a million people that you represent? Right, so I go up on most Monday mornings and come back most Thursday afternoons. And depending on what time, it really depends on what time of year it is. I can usually go back in the afternoon um, in the beginning of the year, and then as the bill load gets heavier, it gets later and later in the day as we stay on the floor longer. And then towards the end of each of the sessions, um, I will be going home Fridays or even Saturdays, depending on um, what the bill load is like. So there's a lot of flying around. Sometimes if there's a major event in the district, uh, maybe a Chamber of Commerce gala, or uh, when we do our big Armenian genocide recognition e a night, um, I'll fly back just for that event and then sometimes fly back the next morning or even the same night, depending on what's happening. So um, the Southwest planes to me are sort of like large buses. That's how, how I feel about them. They're not like real airplanes. They're kind of flying through <laughs> buses with wings and I'm on them uh, quite a lot. Um, nothing compared to members of Congress who have to go back and forth across, force across the country, of course. But there is a lot of running around and a lot of activity and I'll tell you, I'm couldn't be happier with my job. It's a great job for a woman. Uh, it's a great job for those of us who like to be busy and multitask. It's incredibly exciting and gratifying work to be able to, to work with great groups like Habitat. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, well, we are so glad that you are such a great friend to Habitat and you're representing us. Um, I know you mentioned, um, you know, there's no typical weeks right now you know, because we've never, you know, had a pandemic quite like this one before. Um, so what has changed with the COVID-19 measures and how you do your job? Right now, the legislature is struggling to figure out how to do our job safely, but to do our job. And that's something that there are talks right now about how to do that. We are going back into session supposedly on the 4th, uh, May 4th. Wow. And um, we have to try to figure out how to do that while protecting um, members who have various um, reasons why they feel that maybe they can't physically be in the building. And we're limited a little bit because the California Constitution governs a lot of the way that we operate and we can't just change that. Nobody could just change that. 
So we're still figuring out how to do that, but I plan to be back in Sacramento going back and forth again on May 4th. If I can figure out how to keep homeschooling my six-year-old uh, who's in first grade, that's actually the most challenging uh, part of the conversation for me. I, I feel like I was elected to do this. And even though, yes, there's a danger to be flying back and forth and being in going into the Capitol building, uh, it's what I was elected to do. And I, you know, if I'm going to ask a Trader Joe's uh, worker or a delivery truck worker to put themselves in danger, you can be damn sure that I'll be up in the building trying to represent my constituents and doing the work of the state. So um, there's a little bit of a question about that, but I've been spending every week since we've been um, uh, on, on our so-called recess, calling stakeholders all day long and checking in and making sure that service delivery continues and that we don't have people or communities who fall between the cracks. Uh, I represent a very diverse community with a lot of small pockets of sort of sub communities. So trying to find out who to reach out to in all of those communities to make sure that their needs are being met and all of my constituents needs are being met during this time. I've been checking in with hospitals, with school districts, with guidance counselors. Uh, I can't tell you the amount of people with faith, faith based leaders to just make sure that we are organized and that we are. Making sure that everybody in our community um, has their needs met, that everybody is getting fed, that children are being educated that people who need medical help are getting that. And that's been, you know, it's been challenging. I feel like we've been a bit of an air traffic control office. So I have four staffers in the district and I have four staffers in Sacramento, plus another four who are committee staff. And the committee staff are still working on bills because we have 300 bills right now on my committee waiting to be disposed of. Uh, and then all of my staffers though, my eight uh, personal staffers have been spending every single day doing constituent casework. I mean, we have hundreds of people contacting us about EDD, about unemployment insurance problems, about driver's license problems, about immigration issues, you know, all exacerbated because of COVID-19. Small businesses in desperate need of trying to uh, find resources, uh, renters who are feeling that they can't pay their rent. A lot of these people are finding their way to our office and my staff and I are doing the best that we can to try to help them. Thank you. I, I could only, I, I mean, I don't even think I was even able to imagine when I was thinking about how to ask you that, like, I what, really, how does the, our government, you know, our state government continue when we're not even sure we can be, you know, face each other and, and um, you know, or be in the same room. And I was thinking, gosh, you know, when you were sworn in, it wasn't like there was an asterisk that said, unless it was really a dangerous or scary time, right? Like there was no, exception and so you need to not only continue what you're doing but then also respond to um the needs these new needs because of the pandemic so wow i that and still be a mom right <laughs> yeah well government's even more essential right now people are pivoting and really turning to government to help them yes right and so we do we do we need you know leaders like you to to speak for us and and uh, make great decisions, you know, co you know, to take, you know, care and be wise about how we move forward. Thanks. Uh, well, you know what? There's a lot of, the, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you know the compliment, but there's a lot of elected officials and and just leaders in the community that are stepping up, and I think that we really all need to see ourselves as a network and make sure that our network is stronger than ever, so that we work together. Uh, on this, and this is, you know, everyone, this is all everyone who's at all a community leader or block captain or service club member. So I appreciate the comment, but it's it's not about me at all. It's about, you know, us having a community that that draws together even in a stronger way. And Habitat, you know, bringing it back to y'all, Habitat <laughs> has always done that. I mean, Habitat is, is a group that really is out there in a very grassroots way, uh, mobilizing people in the community and groups in the community to, um, you know, to fundamentally provide housing and build housing for people who need it built. I mean, there's nothing more democratic and grassroots and hands on than Habitat's model. So I think that you all understand uh, exactly what I'm talking about, um, probably more than any group that I've talked to during this. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, you, you said it so eloquently, but, but yes, that is definitely what we um, are trying to do um, and continue to do um, throughout the San Gabriel Valley. So speaking of, of you know, people serving um, not necessarily as an elected official as you are, but um, can you tell us or how has your volunteer work and your community service shaped who you are? Um, 
You know, I, I think when I started serving on the design review board, and I, I did that really because I was interested in design and I had been doing a lot of volunteer work, it opened my eyes a little bit as to the, you know, the myriad of kind of voices that are out there when it comes to community planning. And then when I started running for council and got on the council, I, it, it's only then that I realized how many people there are out there who work for the betterment of your of the community. And a lot of people just don't see that. Uh, you know, and I, I guess in every community, there's like the 100 people who are on every board, you know, that you just right. see rotating through the boards. But really, there's thousands of people in every community that help out in some way. And I think that being in elected elective office where a lot of these people find their way to you, you realize that, um, you know, kind of what a community we really are and how many people work. Um, uh, I'd say selflessly to support whatever their interest is, you know, whether it's the PTA or a sports team or helping the homeless. There's so many of those groups. And I feel like I realized when I was on council and even more now that a lot of an elected officials job is to support those efforts. Because, you know, no one person, you know, elect, elect, elected officials don't do any of that work. You know, we, we're not feeding the hungry. Uh, it's it's really uh, it's really a lot of nonprofits and and uh, and government agencies that do that kind of work, and you know our work is to support those efforts and make sure that they are coordinated and focused and effective. I don't even remember what you asked, but that was just something. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, how you're you're volunteering your, yourself um, and be, how has that shaped you? So I think it's been you know lovely that you got to see firsthand and then to realize that. Um, that what you your I guess your strength as an elected official is to make sure that you're coordinating the volunteer efforts of, of others or, or not that you're coordinating the efforts, but that you're coordinating the, the dissemination of services to others. Um, so yeah, yeah, there we go. Like <laughs> That's that. coming up, bro. Um, so at, at, clearly, we're grateful for your commitment to um, increasing affordable housing and that your your commitment to you know, um, I think very um, wise uh, development and planning. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about what has your experience been um, when partnering with Habitat and how we do interact with you and you interact with us? Well, I was really proud that last year, you know, I had gone to Habitat uh, and said, housing's a, a very big interest of mine and Habitat is a great organization and what can we do together? And um, Habitat really put its head together and came back with some bill ideas and we ended up doing a bill with Habitat. And I will say it was a bill leveraging um, uh, accessory dwelling units, ADUs, and making it more usable for the Habitat model uh, based on an experience, some experiences that Habitat had, I think in the kind of Carmel um, Monterey area on a program that worked there, but that because of just technicalities was not legal in Los Angeles County and in most of the state. So um, Habitat helped us write the bill and I will say that of all the bills that I did, it was probably one of the best received bills I've ever done. In fact, the minority leader, the Republican minority leader in the legislature asked to be a principal co-author of the bill. And uh, the bill went through, I think, with nobody voting against it. And, you know, it was just really, it, it was such a smart bill, um, you know, and I, I give Habitat all the credit for that. It was such a smart idea that, um, you know, we were able to get the bill through very easily. And we worked with the county assessor to make sure that it would work properly. And I'm really, you know, I was really proud of, of that partnership. And I hope that it's something that goes on to be helpful to Habitat. Wonderful. And so that is the um, AB 587. Correct. Right. And so um, can you tell us about like how, the how, I mean, thank you for telling us about the, how it was passed unanimously, which is wonderful. But how did you go about crafting that? I mean, I know we, you, you, um, you know, got some assistance from Habitat California. Um, but what was that like, the, the creating that bill and having the, um, I would, is it called bipartisan support or authorship of it? What was that like? Well, you know, I have very good professional staff. So when I talk to them about what I want to do in a bill, it's kind of up to them to then go back and write it into law. And we also have um, legislative counsel that helps us turn the bill ideas into kind of the legalese that we need. And then there's all kinds of work that goes into looking at existing statutes and figuring out if we have to repeal existing statutes within our bill or amend. And all of that, you know, takes a while. And then we also work with um, all kinds of stakeholders who come in, you know, for instance, the county assessor who had concerns about the implementation of the bill. 
uh, we reach out to our cities a lot of times to say, hey, you know, what do you think of this? How does this affect you? Um, to try to get, you know, their sign off on it so we don't run into, you know, uh, uh, problems that we hadn't anticipated with the bill. Right. And then we, you know, have a lot of stakeholders who come in and talk to us about it. Uh, people will always find their way, you know, and then a whole lot of groups that we never even reach out to, to kind, kind of send in support letters or oppose letters. So uh, uh, that's the process. And so that's what happened with this bill. I will say this bill is a sort of a, not it wasn't a very difficult or complicated bill. So it, well, it didn't take up a ton of our staff's time. You know, once we were able to figure out sort of what co government codes to amend and, and how to write it in a way that made sense for um, the different county assessors, because it does have to do with sort of subdivisions, it was not a particularly difficult bill. And at the time, we did it uh, in conjunction with a package of ADU bills that I authored. I had four ADU bills uh, in that year. And there was a whole group of legislators who were also working on ADU legislation as a you know, way to kind of work on the housing crisis. And so it was part of this package of larger ADU bills as well. Okay. So um, how do you see, or have you been able to see already, um, AB 587 and the other bills that surrounded it beginning to help um, change or improve housing locally. Have we seen that or is it still in, in progress? You know, I'm not sense? sure if yeah. any of our local, oh, sorry, there's a little bit of a, a kind of a delay, so it's a little hard for me to sometimes tell, but I, I, I don't know whether any of the local habitats are trying to um, use the bill right now to create ADUs along with the habitat projects and either sell them separately or retain them when you sell other uh, property. I hope that they are looking at that because I think it's, you know, it's, it's really another tool in the toolbox. It's not going to be appropriate for every project. But it's certainly something that that habitat I would hope and other nonprofit developers because it's it's open to any nonprofit developer that they look at it and see if it makes sense with every project that they that they work on and complete. Right. Yes, and I would say I, I know for San Gabriel Valley we are definitely um, looking to um, make use of AB five eighty seven. Um, so. Yeah, so I you know that is actually it's really exciting for us and we're hoping to make some headway on it. Um, this coming year, as long as we can all get back together again <laughs> and uh, gather. Um, okay, so how have efforts such as our Women Build Movement um, impacted the housing crisis in the San Gabriel Valley? You would know better than me <laughs> in terms of you know the number of families that you sure, housed. Right. And I, I you know Habitat's work is substantial and it's a different model than a lot of other organizations. Um, you know, it's a very high quality model. It's very um, uh, it involves the community in a really wonderful way. You know, I think that sometimes one of the problems with building housing, whether it's affordable or not affordable is that there becomes an opposition between the developers and the communities. And Habitat is, a, a because it, it, it does require community involvement, is a great way to get buy-in from the communities. Uh, and it's something that we really, you know, I think need more of. We need to have more people understand why building housing is important. Um, and, you know, that's something that I think that Habitat, you know, given its deep roots in every community is, is uniquely positioned to try to make people understand why we have to add more affordable housing in our communities. And also to be the living example about the fact that you can build new housing in a way that's sensitive to its surroundings and that fits in well and that adds you know, to the built environment and to the community. Uh, and a lot of times there's a lot of fear in communities when people talk about outing, adding any new housing. Yes, and so I think, yeah, so it's overcoming those, the, the stigma I think is definitely, um, one of the ways um, I think women build as an awareness raiser and as an advocacy, um, as you know, champions of, of, of advocating for um, affordable housing. I, I think that's for for me. I think that's one of the things that are two of the things that really stand out um, about women build. Besides it just being a really awesome you know event, um, and just to see so many you know women building and hammering and and you know, making the, the, the homes um, and really challenging themselves um, and, um, and raising money to do it. So we, we are very, uh, we love our women builders. <laughs> you can't tell. It's terrific. <laughs> um, it's very, it's very
very unique. So yes. I <laughs> we love it. Um, so um, what can our audience, our women builders do um, from home um, to, uh, since we are in this very unique, you know, time, since most, some of, many of us are from home, um, what, what can we do as far as supporting what, um, what either, you know, um, what any of your legislation has started or anything we can do to alleviate the housing crisis in the San Gabriel Valley? Have you come across any um, other groups that are, um, or, or just, you know, either grassroots or just individuals who are um, working towards alleviating the housing crisis despite having to, you know, stay at home? Well, there are certainly um, a lot of uh, builders out there and a lot of, um, uh, um, there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, building more housing and about alleviating the housing crisis. You know, I am work working on two uh, pieces of legislation um, looking at streamlining some of the CEQA process for affordable housing, AB 2323 and AB 3279, and any support or help that um, Habitat would like to give to that, of course, you know, I would love for you to review the bills, review the legislation, let us know what you think. It's still a work in progress, but those are two bills that I am planning to try to move this year. Uh, 3232 builds on some work that we've been doing with the governor's office and trying to find ways of consolidating a lot of the existing exemptions under CEQA for affordable housing and infill housing and, and just clarifying it and streamlining, you know, those good projects that really need to move quickly. Uh, and it's also a bill that's trying to do that in a way that's sensitive to the very real reasons that CEQA exists uh, to make sure we have environmental protections and, and other types of protections. So it's not a bill that tries to gut CEQA as many has have done, but one that tries to respect the process, but really uh, retain it for those projects that need it and then allow, you know, good housing projects to have some of that burden lifted from them. Uh, you know, if we can do it for sports stadiums, we should certainly be able to do it for affordable housing. And this is a bill that yes. tries to get serious about doing that. So hopefully you can, you know, take a look at that bill and let us know what you think. Um, okay. That I was 3232. Yes, 3232. And, and the other one is, let me just look at the number. 3279. Uh, Yes, 3279 and I'm uh, sorry, 2323, not 3232. 2323, <laughs> that's my dyslexia speaking. Um, no worries. <laughs> the, other, the other thing I would say is, you know, we have such a huge and growing NIMBY movement out there. You know, we have entire cities that are trying to do building moratoriums. We have people who think that, if you, you know, they all want us to solve the housing crisis. Everybody wants to take homeless people off the streets. They just don't want to do it anywhere in their own city or in their own community. So we have to have people, you know, understand that we all have to be part of the solution and that we can't say that, you know, certain neighborhoods are just off limits to any development ever. And, uh, you know, of course, we want it to be appropriate. We want things that build neighborhoods and build communities and add to them. So we have to make sure that what develop the development that's done is responsible so that they don't become the poster child of what people don't want in their areas. But at the same time, we have to also have people acknowledge that we need to build more housing and we need a lot more affordable housing. So, you know, making sure that we're all cheerleaders for that um, is important because those voices that are always the ones that say no, 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 are the loudest voices. And, you know, I, I happen to represent some cities that have done some great work with housing and I have cities that, you know, I have a city that is telling me that the fact that we now are forcing them to allow ADUs to be built is going to absolutely destroy their neighborhoods. And, you know, we need to kind of push back on some of that. Uh, I've had people tell me that people who rent shouldn't be in single family neighborhoods because they're a different class of people. I mean, I've had elected officials in my district tell me that to my face, that they paid a lot of money to be in a single family home and they don't want to live with people who are not owners because they're, you know, they don't care about the neighborhood and they come and they go and they leave trash. And I mean, I've had elected officials tell me this to my face and we have to call that out for what it is. We can't be, be silent about that kind of rhetoric when we hear it. Besides, you know, raising our, 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 our opposition when we hear those sorts of, um, you know, NIMBY <laughs> you know, um, comments, what have you found to be really successful in uh, changing or, or even mildly successful in, in changing how the cities um, uh, view affordable housing? 
Well, certainly when you have great examples like the one that have the ones that Habitat's built, and we've got some other great developers that have built in the area who've done projects that when people drive past them, they think that they're luxury housing or they think that they're just great housing stock. They're not what they picture in their mind. Right. Uh, and also humanizing the clients, humanizing the families and the residents who live in these buildings so that people understand that these are people that you want in your community. Uh, that they are your community members, they are your parents, they are your your neighbors, they are your children potentially, um, that everybody is deserving of housing. And, you know, uh, and make sure that, you know, they have a voice because they, they don't have a voice. These are, you know, these are people that aren't going to necessarily go to a city council meeting and speak up for themselves. They're too busy trying to earn a living and take care of their kids. Uh, sometimes they're seniors. A lot of times they feel intimidated. They may not have great language skills. We have to protect them, you know, and we have to speak for them if they can't speak for themselves. Absolutely. Well, thank you. That is wonderful to know that, you know, the, the, the everyday person who just cares about affordable housing and cares about, you know, their, their sister or fellow person um, can, uh, you know, by knowing the stories and, and, you know, knowing our homeowners, our Habitat homeowners, um, and and sharing their the you know their story as well as their successes, um, and that they're also you know going after the American dream, just like you know perhaps you know the person who's you know saying not in my backyard. So thank you for that you know very wise and and uh, inspiring reminder um, that that we do need to speak up for those who can't uh, or won't speak up for themselves when it comes to affordable housing. Um, so thank you. Um, okay, so um, I am uh, out of our <laughs> uh, pre uh, my questions that I had prepared. Um, and so for the um, audience, um, it looks like we'll have quite a bit of time uh, to field questions from you all. Um, and so if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and um, send your questions in to Steve. Um, and the way you would do that is you um, highlight his name with your um, mouse and uh, put the cursor on it and then go ahead and um, like click on it and then send the, the message as you normally would um, any kind of chat um, message. Um, and it looks like we've got a first question from uh, Brianna L. And she'd like to know, um, is there a, a woman um, in your, um, I, I guess, as you've come up through the ranks um, or just as you, you know, entered into your career, um, who uh, is someone that you look up to and admire? Well, I'm looking at one right now, Elaine Wilkerson. And let me tell you, when I was on uh, the design review board, Elaine was the planning director of the city of Glendale. And I can't tell you how much she supported me and helped me and took me under her wing and kind of taught me about planning and about the city. And then when I went to run for city council, she was the person, she was my campaign manager. She, she got me elected both wow. times. I, if I wasn't for Elaine, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Uh, she's, you know, one of those, remember I was talking about those people who are on every board and commission? That's Elaine. <laughs> she has been in my, I'd say in terms of my political life, she's probably the, she's like the foundation. She's the foundational woman in my political career. So you can blame wow. her if you don't like what I have to say and what I do. You have to blame, blame Elaine because if it wasn't for her, none of this would have happened. I can tell you right now. Oh, I hear you. And a lot of what we do um, in the San Gabriel Valley Habitat wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Elaine and continues because of Elaine. So definitely hats off to Elaine. Um, what, a, what a lovely um, like reunion between the two of you here. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, so what um, advice, let me see, I think this one may be coming from um, Melinda S. And um, and it's kind of statement. It's we need women leaders to show that they can be leaders. What advice would you give to um, women who are considering uh, running for office? Oh boy, I could talk for like an hour. I could talk for two hours. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to talk for two hours, but I'll just say that you know they've done stud. There's they've done studies. I don't know who they is, but the they out there have done studies, and. 
I guess the, the determination is that women have to be asked to run over and over and over again, generally, and not to generalize, because there's a lot of women out there that, that doesn't hold, you know, anytime you generalize, there's always people that aren't like that. And certainly our younger generation, I think, is a little bit more, hopefully a little bit uh, uh, better about this than some of us older folks. Uh, men, uh, you know, hit 17 and decide they're going to be president of the United States uh, and that they deserve to be, you know, at 25. Uh, I mean, all you have to do is look at the women who were the men who were on the presidential stage uh, that compare some of the ages to the women to see that men, you know, at a very young age feel that they're ready to, you know, God run for Congress, run for president, um, that they're, you know, that it's there for them. They deserve it. They got great ideas. So it should be them. Whereas women sit around and think, boy, you know, I'm just, I, I think I need to study. Maybe I should go to school. Um, you know, I need to learn a lot more. I'll go on some boards and commissions. Maybe, maybe one day it'll be right for me. Maybe a bunch of people will ask me and help me and support me. Uh, you know, we don't go into it nearly with the um, confidence a lot of times that the men do. And so we need to be asked a lot. You know, women need to be asked. Women need to be pushed out there sometimes. And, you know, when they do apply for those boards and commissions, most of the time they end up sitting in the folders because, the, you know, a lot of the men who make up the city councils don't see them as being their planning commissioner or being, you know, on those important committees, maybe on the commission on the status of women or the arts commission or the parks commission. But, oh, you want to be a planning commissioner? No, no, that's going to be the men. So we have to fight for it and we have to support each other. You know, when we get that little bit of influence, we have to use it to support other women. There's a great gift that's out there. You guys are computer, you know, computer E of a woman lifting another woman up and then that woman reaching down and lifting that woman up. You know, and so you have this chain of women lifting each other above themselves, reaching down and lifting them up. Well, we can't expect that, that you know, the men are going to do that for us necessarily, although there's a lot of supportive men, but we have to help each other out. I'm a member of the uh, Legislative Women's Caucus, and I'll tell you, we spend a lot of time making sure that our sisters in the legislature get in the photos, get on the important committees, uh, that we push each other front and center, uh, because it's really, it's way too easy for us to be forgotten about. I'll just tell you a little anecdote. So my first year in the legislature, and by the way, we're California. We got a bunch of woke men in that legislature. Yes. You know, we're Democrats. <laughs> uh, we, you know, we have feminist men. They're pro-choice. They're pro-women. You know, uh, so we have kind of have the most enlightened of the enlightened. So my first yes. year in the legislature, it's our last night of session, and we're all on the floor till three thirty, four in the morning or something. I'm exhausted. We're all exhausted. We've been there for days and days and days. We finally finish. I go home because I'm supposed to be on an airplane at, you know, nine in the morning for some stupid thing, like some stupid reason. And I'm on my way home in the car and I happened to look at Twitter and the, the speaker had had a little press conference with some of the members. And it was the speaker saying, boy, we accomplished really great things this year. And we did this and we did that. It was a historic year. And I'm looking at this photo from this press conference. How many women do you think were in that photo that was all over Twitter and all over the press? None. It was like a oh. 12 <laughs> Zero. <laughs> I tweeted without really thinking about it and not even trying to be clever. I just said, I just want to say that there were some women involved with this great historic year. Well, I got, I mean, I can't tell you that my phone was ringing. People were going crazy over it. And I will tell you something that never again did the speaker do a press conference and not have women front and center in the photos. So we have to call that, that nonsense out. That's my daughter, that hand just came in. That's okay. <laughs> We have to call that nonsense out when we see it. We can't be shy. And if there's no women in the frame, we got to say, how come there were no women? Where are the women? How come there's no women in this task force or that task force or this committee or that committee? That's unacceptable. And we have to stand up and say that and help and say, you know, here's 10 women that should be on that committee. Here's 10 women that should be on that task force. Why are there no women? And we need to make the men answer that question publicly. So I would say that. Yeah. Uh, no. And in terms of getting women elected, we have to rally behind them. We need the Elaine Wilkerson's of the world to be out there saying, if you run, Rachel, honey, stop it, please. If the, if the, you know, we need the Elaine Wilkerson's to be out there saying, if you do this, I will stuff the envelopes and I will raise the money with you and I will be there with you every step of the way. We have to do that for each other. It's got to be the women doing it for the women. And we have got to be there to support our sisters and finding those women who we want to be our leaders and then telling them, I want you to run and I'm going to commit this amount of money to you and this amount of time to you and you're going to do it, but we're going to get a whole group to support you and then, you know, have that little village of women to do it so that one day this one can be president you know, right. more easily. 
<laughs> exactly. And we need to vote for each other. <laughs> we need to vote for each other. And write. there's also statistics that women write checks at a lower amount to other women than they do to men. So we got to stop that. Right. Absolutely. And also, don't expect our women politicians to be perfect. Let's not always hold out for perfection. We're going to stretch. I stretch for women. You know, there's a point where I can't stretch any further sometimes, but I'll stretch for those women and support them. Right. And I don't think anyone expects our male politicians to be perfect. We, we would love it if they could, you know, but I think it's, you know, we know that that's unrealistic, yet we put that in our own. Mm -hmm. You have to be quiet. There's a lot of people watching this. Right? All right, we're getting comments that your daughter is very cute. <laughs> you hear that? You're cute. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Does she have any wise words to say? <laughs> right now she's jumping on the bed. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sitting on the bed. I thought this would be a quiet, safe place, but. No, that's wonderful. Um, okay, let's see. We have. Um, a, oh, a very habitat focused question. Um, what recommendations do you have um, for habitat's future efforts and focus? Are there any specific situations that have come to your office that um, come to mind? Uh, I'm just trying to think of anything that's come up recently because of COVID. I mean, I think that our big challenge in the next um, year honestly is going to be keeping roofs over people's heads uh, as much as building them um, uh, you know as people lose their jobs and we're looking at 50 percent unemployment here in los angeles county 50 percent unemployment right you know in the next few months right um, there's it's going to be really hard for people to keep that roof over their heads and their families heads even if we have the um, uh, freeze on paying rents and on uh, um, evictions once that freeze is lifted they have to pay all that money back so whatever support that Habitat can help, you know, garner for those folks so that we don't have a huge wave of homeless families and homeless individuals, uh, I'd say that that's going to be, you know, really an imperative. Um, and I think that there's a bit of an opportunity as we look towards maybe financing recovery to have affordable housing be part of that recovery and affordable housing construction be part of that recovery because we need to have a lot more affordable housing out there. And, you know, we're going to need to have some kind of recovery, whether it's tax increment financing or more tax incentives or bond financing. You know, we're exploring all of that right now and afford building affordable housing needs to be a part of that. And I think Habitat is in a position to help with that conversation. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I, I would hope that I hope that we would take that charge up, um, not only because you, you've just said it, but it's the right thing to do. Um, so, yeah, exactly. Um, so right on, Laura. <laughs> um, and um, here's an, an another one, um, and it might be um, just adding uh, maybe a, a, another layer to your, your um, recent answer. Um, is there any discussion about the state helping cities fund land acquisition for affordable housing? Uh, the state, I think, is not going to have uh, two dimes to rub together to even pay its own employees when this is all said and done. So um, if I, you know, I know there's a lot of cities out there asking the state to kind of bail them out and whatever financial deficits they have, I, I would say, you know, a dose of reality, the funds for that are going to be very limited, right. and, you know, going into the near future. I think that we're going to have enough trouble um, continuing to fund the very worthy programs that we fund right now. I think we're going to have to get more creative than that. You know, whether it's looking at, you know, and, and tax incentives sound great, but that's money that eventually comes out of our school system and out of all kinds of other um, entities who rely on those taxes. So we're going to have to try to be in conversation with our stakeholders and find that 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 path. And I, I'm not prepared right now to say what that path is, but oh, these sure. are these are the challenges for sure. Right, right. Yeah, there is, there is maybe surplus state land that's that could be an easier ask. Um, for you know that to be turned over for for building affordable housing, I think that's maybe a an intermediary step. I, I think that you know, look, there's going to be a lot of hotels that fail that could be you know repurposed. There's going to be a lot of uh, um, office buildings that are vacant. Can we repurpose and do adaptive reuse to turn that into housing of some sort? You know, a mix of affordable and market rate housing. I think we have to get really creative right now about uh, 
how we're going to house people and, and where the funding is going to come from, and also looking at those assets and resources that already exist right now. And maybe Habitat could pivot towards re adapting and, and reusing some of those types of, of existing structures. No, that's wonderful. I think you're, I, I love that term that you use, the pivot of um, and, and creativity. Um, and how do we really make this, um, you know, awful situation? How do we turn it into um, still continuing on our mission? And how do we look at it differently? And, and, and like you said, pivot and, and see what is available, not just what we've always thought, at, you know, just land, but what about existing buildings? And how do we then you know, access those for affordable housing? So yeah. that is definitely a wonderful charge um, <laughs> that you've given us as well as inspiration. And um, I'm thinking some of my colleagues who are on this um, webinar are, you know, lights are going off in their heads right now. So I know it is for me. So thank you. Um, oh, here's a, here's a fun question. Um, so after homeschooling uh, your daughter now for the last couple of weeks, um, what do you think about public school teachers or uh, even private school teachers or teachers in general? Um, what, do, what do you think about that? <laughs> and the question was actually, no, I've, I've always, you need to raise. <laughs> I've always appreciated teachers and I certainly appreciate them even more right now. You know, I, I will say, um, you know, I also realized that I think that little kids are programmed to push back on their mommies and their parents much differently than they are on other adults and authority figures. Yes. I know that for a fact, my daughter does not, you know, say no uh, to her teacher the way she says no to me. So for any other parent that are listening out there, you know, I think we all have to recognize our own limitations in terms of, you know, what we can and can't expect our kids to, to do. Um, I mean, I, it's easy for me to say that. I mean, I was like almost a crying mess a couple hours ago because I had a oh. child screaming at me about not wanting, not being able to do her work on the computer. I have had so much trouble trying to figure out all these apps that are all of a sudden I'm supposed to be using, you know, Seesaw and Epic and Clo Clever and Khan Academy and RK, you know, publishing. Someone sent me some viral meme where it's like, the teachers are saying to the parents, the teachers are saying like, you go to the Zork app and open the fifth page and go to the Krodesky. And then, you know, it's like this whole long thing. And then it's the parents going, that's kind of how I feel. I mean, it is challenging. And I've been on conference calls and sem like Zoom calls literally all day today with my colleagues, with different agencies. And during that time, my daughter broke a jar by the swimming pool, got glass all around the pool and in the pool. It's still there. My vacuum cleaner broke when I tried to use it. It's dead. Um, I had to walk the dog while I was doing all this. I had to try to get her to do some of her work. She literally has been eating. I don't, I mean, I did feed her. I will say I did feed her, but also in between my feeding her, I think that she's gotten a hold of a lot of, you know, stuff she wasn't supposed to be eating like chocolate and other stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's a hot mess around here. Um, and you know, and we have, we have, you know, more resources than a lot of people. So, you know, we have people that are out there working out of the house. I don't, you know, and their kids are, I don't know what they're doing, you know, and we have to just keep that in mind that, okay, thank you. She said she's going to finish her work. Oh. I have the iPad, so I know she's not, but that's okay. Um, but, you know, there, you know, the fact that, you know, I'm struggling with this. Um, there are people out there who are trying to do this with kids where they're not primarily English speakers, where they're working in service jobs or working two jobs right now out of the house. Um, and their kids are home. You know, we've got medical professionals who don't want to come home because they don't want to infect their family. I mean, we've got people that we have people that are living two, three families in an apartment um, where their kids are trying to study on the kitchen table when there's people eating around them. I mean, you know, I think that the biggest take home about that, you know, the, the, the situation with education is that we already have an education gap, achievement gap, and we know we have that. And this is going to really exacerbate that. And how do we prevent that from widening our achievement gap. You know, these are things that, that legislators and others are, are kind of talking about and thinking about all day long. So yes, I absolutely appreciate teachers. I've always appreciated them. I will say my teacher, my daughter has done the most incredible job of transitioning her education to an online format in an incredibly short amount of time. And I just can't believe it. And my daughter, and she's doing it all in French because my daughter's in an immersion program at her school. So, you know, it's, um, you know, my, uh, she's, our teachers are, are heroes right now. 
So I'm going to go out on a limb. Is that um, French influence from your husband? I wish my husband was speaking more French to my daughter. It, it's okay. we're able to do it a little more easily because he does. He can translate the lessons. We have parents in her program in her class who don't speak French. who are trying to run the lessons through Google Translate. God bless them. No, Glendale Glendale um, Public School System has language immersion programs. Uh, has a bunch of them, and my daughter is in a school, a public elementary school that is um, has a immersion program with four languages. So she's in the wow. French portion of those languages. How, is she liking it? <laughs> yeah, she likes it. Good. Uh, she's that, missing her friends and you know missing school for sure. Oh, oh yeah, I bet. Um, I have a senior in high school, and uh, yes, we, she is definitely missing. She's feeling like she is missing out, um, and and she, I guess, in some ways, she very much is. <laughs> so very appropriate how she's feeling. Um, so okay, well, I'm trying to see if there are any other. Um, any other questions? I don't see any new ones coming through. Okay. Um, so, uh, Laura, is there anything else that you would like to share with us um, or um, any, you know, final, you know, thoughts about, um, you know, the role of women or, you know, your role um, and multiple roles that you um, have or any um, exciting bills that um, may not be something that we've talked about today, but that are very important to you that you um, are, are hoping to, to uh, get past in this upcoming um I'll just say how how grateful I am to Habitat for all the work that you do and in the way that you do it in such a community based and grassroots uh, way. It's very unique and it's very important and it really pulls the community in to the projects and it gives them the sense of ownership of the projects that no other affordable housing developer um, is able to really to gain. And so I know it's challenging to to kind of have your model, but I think that the dividend it pays with that sense of ownership uh, for communities uh, makes it worthwhile. And you've also been able to do it at a certain level of scale, which is really impressive. Uh, I do think that rethinking that model a little bit to some adaptive reuse to take advantage of what we're going to have this glut of, of other types of buildings is an opportunity. Um, I'm happy to work with you on that and help you with that. And I'm, I can say that, that probably the LA caucus would love to work with you on that. So maybe there can be a future conversation um, with the LA caucus, which is still meeting weekly and we're meeting virtually on Habitat's role and, and nonprofits developers role in doing that kind of adaptive reuse um, so that we don't end up with a bunch of buildings that are shuttered and falling apart while we try to kind of break ground on new buildings that we use what we have. Um, uh, you know, and all of you personally, I know that, you know, you're all, if not all of you, most of you are volunteers and how much I appreciate your efforts because a lot of people don't do that. And I know the work that that is and the heartbreak and the difficulty. So thank you. Um, and for your help with the bill that I that you've sponsored with me last year, it was such an honor to be able to carry that legislation and work arm in arm with Habitat. And just, you know, I'm I'm here to to help you do what you do because you support the people in our community who need the most help. Uh, and it's great to be looking at this uh, vision of women on at least on my front screen because you know Rachel likes to say my daughter says girls rule the world. Yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> women women carry the world on their shoulders. Um, yes, that's an African proverb. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I think that having that work done shown front and center is inspirational, you know, to other women and to, to up and coming leaders. So keeping that that work uh, visible and out there uh, is very important to me personally as well. So thank you Thanks for inviting me today. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Um, we, are, we are getting really close to running out of time. So Laura, thank you again. For your wit and your wisdom, we are so lucky to have you representing us. Um, and uh, we haven't, we've had to postpone Women Build. Um, we're hoping to have it um, at some point later um, this year. Uh, it was supposed to be in about two weeks. So we hope we can um, keep your office informed and hopefully we will see you in some way, shape or form um, out uh, supporting uh, Women Build as well. Um, and uh, we are going to be putting up some um, information for everyone uh, who has attended um, about staying involved with Women Build 2020 and encourage you to sign up, fundraise, and join us again in two weeks for our next Women Build a Better World interview. I don't know if we can get any better than um, our inaugural interview with 
um, Laura Friedman. So thank you again. Thanks everyone. And bye for now.